what up Cavs Nation, I'm your host Ethan Sands and I'm back with another episode of the Wine and Gold Talk Podcast. I'm joined by your favorite beat reporter, Chris Fedor. What up Chris? Ethan, what's going on man? How are you? Man, I know you're tired because I'm tired. (laughs) And we got a lot more coming our way. And you especially heading to New Orleans and Houston and all of those trips coming up. But before we get into those games, I want to take a look at what has happened over the last week with the Cavaliers. Chris, we mentioned it yesterday. It's been crazy. But tonight on Monday... Against the Phoenix Suns, it felt like something that was improbable almost happened once again. And Darius Garland got off to a scorching start, 25 points in the half, the most in a half of his career, 21 points in the first quarter, the most first quarter points of his career. What did you think about how he just got out the gate so hot? We'll get to how he played the rest of the game, but I want to get your reaction. Well, that's the thing that his teammates have been urging him to do. That's the thing that the coaching staff has been urging him to do. Look for his own. Be aggressive. When Donovan Mitchell is not out there, when Evan Mobley is not available, when Max Struess isn't out there to knock down threes and create chaos and a whole bunch of off-ball movement, you need his scoring. Yeah, I mean, Darius is the kind of guy who tries to get his teammates involved. He's the kind of guy who tries to make the right play. He's a point guard at heart, but they need him to be aggressive. They need him to dictate terms. They need him to break down the defense. And that's what you saw in the first quarter tonight. Phoenix came in with a specific strategy against Darius, the way that they were guarding the pick and roll. They took advantage of Nurkic being out there over and over and over again. And it turned into an explosive, combustible first quarter. The other thing that stands out to me about the first quarter is that Darius, at times, since coming back from the fractured jaw, has struggled in terms of getting all the way to the basket, being able to consistently beat his man off the dribble. And he doesn't have very much of an in-between game. So the best nights that we've seen from Darius recently, Ethan, have been when he's lighting it up from three-point range. And that's what happened in the first quarter. He took advantage of the defensive coverage of the Suns, And it allowed him to start getting hot from three-point range, getting clean looks from three-point range. And then, of course, the Suns made the adjustment and changed their coverage. But that aggressive Darius is the one that teammates have been urging and coaches have been urging as well. For some reason, it's just hard for him to be that level of aggressive constantly. Yeah, Chris, and I think it's ironic or somewhat funny that the game that it felt like he got his inside game back was against the Timberwolves, which is one of the better interior teams. But in today's game, in the first quarter, he had eight field goal attempts, right? For the remainder of the game, he had nine field goal attempts. And it was a testament to the Suns' defense switching and trapping and pestering and double teaming and things of that nature. But the offense of the Cavs really didn't get that boost that it needed once Darius's production went down. And it was hard to see that distribution of offensive production with all the rest of the players. And it, obviously, you look across the stat sheet and you see that Devin Booker, Bradley Beal, and Kevin Durant combined for 88 of the Suns' 117 points. Obviously, the Cavs don't have that kind of firepower with Donovan Mitchell, Max Struess, Dean Wade, Evan Mobley all being out, but you needed Darius Garland to be that. And once his production kind of went down because of how much attention he was getting, you kind of saw the entire Cavs offense kind of slim down in that way too. Don't you agree? Yeah, I do. I also think it's fair to point out that The Cavs had an offensive rating tonight of 116.4. That's pretty good. Given everything that they were missing tonight, it's pretty good. It's just that they were playing against the Phoenix Suns with all of their firepower, with all of their explosive dynamic scores. So the Cavs, to me, they just didn't have the answers on the defensive end of the floor. Third quarter, the other night against Brooklyn, gave up a massive 44-point quarter. Third quarter tonight against the Suns, 
gave up 34, including 19 against Kevin Durant. The Cavs kept making an error of leaving him, and I know it's hard because you've got Devin Booker, Bradley Beal, Kevin Durant, Grayson Allen, all on the floor, all at the same time. It's almost as if you have to pick your poison, but you don't leave Kevin Durant. It's Kevin freaking Durant. And even he said after the game tonight, Ethan, that he was very, very surprised that that the Cavs continued to help off of him of all the guys that you're going to help off of. Kevin Durant? Really? So he was surprised by that. I was surprised by that. I think some of that was defensive miscommunication. I think some of that was poor planning. I also think that was also poor execution from time to time. But the Cavs had a defensive rating tonight of 124. The way that they're constructed, given what they're missing, they're not going to win too many games against too many teams with that kind of defensive rating. It wasn't good enough on that end of the floor. And I know it's hard because the Suns are that good on offense. But to me, that's that's what happened tonight, more so than the offense. I thought the offense was good enough, especially in long stretches, given everything that they were missing at that end of the floor. Right, and I think we mentioned it in the last podcast that Dean Wade's presence was missed. I think you met, missed him even more tonight, defensively especially, with the other guys that they had to guard. And I don't want to talk about that too much because we got into that pretty deep yesterday. But what I do want to mention is we've talked about the punking and we talked about people trying to over stronghold the Cavs. And Jared Allen, I was impressed with how he handled Nurkic because at the beginning of the game, there were multiple times where Nurkic just put his shoulder down and kept going into Jared Allen. And even though Jared might have hit the floor a couple times or whatever, he did not stray away from that on the offensive or defensive end. He was 5 of 7 with 15 points and 10 rebounds, and he held Nurkic to 9 points and 8 rebounds. And even though Nurkic was 4 of 5 from the field, I think Jared limited how he was able to contribute on that end of the floor. And obviously also the other four guys on the floor with him taking almost 20 shots a piece kind of helps that. But I think Jared Allen is beginning to become more of a, even though you might come at me, I'm not going to back down kind of guy. Are you getting that sense too? He's just a guy, Ethan, that just doesn't give an F. That's how he's wired. The other night, Anthony Edwards dunked over top of him and Jared just kind of laughed as if he cared. I mean, Anthony Edwards was pumped. He was screaming. He was roaring. And Jared kind of looked at him like, I don't give a bleep. And I think that's kind of how he is. He took a lot of crap from a lot of people given his playoff performance against the Knicks last year. It ran him off of social media because of all the things that people were saying to him in the aftermath of him talking about the lights being too bright. I just think he's a different guy. He's stronger. He's more mature. He's more physical. He was hardened by that playoff series. He learned a lot from that playoff series, just like the Cavs learned a lot from that playoff series. There's a different level of toughness that I think he has brought this year compared to last year, and it all stems from what happened in that series against the Knicks. So I do think he's a kind of guy right now, so sure of himself, so confident in his game and playing at such a high level that he isn't going to back down against Nurkic. He isn't going to back down against Gobert. He isn't going to back down against any of these guys, maybe Valanchunas against the New Orleans Pelicans. He's going to try and stand his ground. He's going to try and anchor the defense. He's going to be heavily involved on the offense for the Cavs. And I think it's all a product of this is just a different, confident Jared Allen than the guy that we saw in the first round series against the Knicks. And with confidence comes more assurance and you have what you see from Jared throughout the course of the season. Yeah, Chris. And I want to quickly move on to one or two last things about tonight's game, because I know you notice this too. The Cavs went extremely small to end the game against the Phoenix Suns, playing Craig Porter Jr., Karis LeVert, and Darius Garland in the basically three-guard backcourt. And to me, I liked it. I know you were definitely probably surprised about seeing those three on the court together because of what we've discussed and how it's hard to get those kind of minutes for those three guards at the same time. 
But I didn't see Darius Garland's game affect Craig Porter Jr.'s game as much as I thought it was going to with saying that one or the other needed the ball more. I honestly think it might have helped Craig because Darius was getting so much attention. And then you look at the fact that Karis LeVert was able to be basically the point guard with Darius moving to shooting guard in the beginning of the game when Darius was really going off because Darius needed somebody to feed him the ball, somebody to get him around screens and get him the ball in his hands because, sure, he was creating some off the dribble, but we know how dangerous he is when he's getting off of screens and things like that. And Karras ended the game with a double-double, 17 points and 11, 11 assists. And I think his game has just been elevated as the point guard role, especially with him in the starting lineup. How did you feel about the three-guard lineup with Isaac Okoro and Jared Allen to finish the game? Well, I think it's going to work against certain opponents, and I think it's something that the Cavs are going to continue to look at as they continue to play these stretch of games without Evan Mobley and then without Max Struess. And they're just going to try and piece it all together and find the best two-man combinations, three-man combinations, four-man, five-man, all of that kind of stuff. And that's why we talk all the time, Ethan, when it comes to the last few spots in the rotation or different lineups that J.B. Bickerstaff wants to try or wants to use a lot of it is going to be situational. A lot of it is going to be dictated by matchups. A lot of it is going to be dictated by game flow. And I think it made sense to try it tonight against the Phoenix Suns because Kevin Durant was playing the five. It wasn't Nurkic. Eubanks was out there from time to time as well. And they play a lot of like-sized guards also. So when you have Grayson Allen playing small forward, you can get away with downsizing a little bit because he's six foot four. When you have Bradley Beal, Devin Booker, and Grayson Allen all on the court at the same time, you're talking about the tallest one of those guys is six foot five. You can get away with downsizing. And it made more sense for the Cavs to go that way too, Ethan, because as you said, everybody was trying to get the ball out of the hands of Darius Garland. So if Darius is going to be the focus of the defense, if they're going to be committed to putting two on the ball, getting it out of his hands, you need other playmakers around him so that when he gives it up, somebody else can make the next best play, whether it's Craig Porter Jr., whether it's Karis LeVert. If you have Sam Merrill in the game at that time, maybe it's a little bit different in terms of how the offense is going to function because Sam is not the same kind of playmaker as Craig Porter Jr. or Karis LeVert. And George Niang is somebody that you're able to go away from in this type of matchup because you didn't really have a great matchup for him that made the most sense to get the most out of him. So you replace Niang with Okoro in a small ball look or Levert in a small ball look, and that's kind of what the game required. That's kind of what the matchups dictated in a way. And if the Cavs are going to go into these games so shorthanded at the power forward spot, you know, Ethan, they're going to have to get creative because giving Isaiah Mobley, giving him, you know, 15 to 18 minutes at this stage of his development, at this stage of his career, it's probably not the best way to go for the Cavs. And that's why they need Dean Wade back. And that's why they need Evan Mobley back because suddenly they're thin at the power forward spot. But it just showed that there are different looks based on the roster construction that they can go to based on the personnel of the other team and based on game flow. And I thought it made sense that J.B. Bickerstaff chose to downsize against the Suns. Yeah, and I wanted to make this quick tidbit because you mentioned Isaiah Mobley. And Isaiah is a guy who was given the task of coming up in the G League, and one of his main assignments tonight was guarding Kevin Durant. And that is an unfavorable matchup for almost any player in the NBA, much less somebody who is barely getting NBA minutes. But Isaiah, ironically enough, might have been one of the better guys to guard Kevin Durant because he's had experience guarding him in the past. He mentioned post game that he's worked out with Karis LeVert, who's also close with Kevin Durant, and they work out together on occasion. They all work together at Academy USA in California, close to Los Angeles. Evan Mobley, Isaiah Mobley, Karis LeVert, Spencer Dinwiddie, all those guys go to Academy USA in the offseason. So Evan has guarded KD, 
Isaiah Mobley has guarded KD in those pickup runs. And I think it probably gave Isaiah a little bit of confidence because, you know, he wasn't awestruck because he's guarded him in the past, albeit not with the same stakes, not in an NBA game, but in a pickup game. Yeah, and even though he's guarded him in the past, he definitely was like, there were a couple where his hands were in his face and he just was like, what am I supposed to do? (laughs) Because it's Kevin Durant. But Chris, I wanted to circle back to this last point about this game. Darius Garland had five points in the entire second half and only made two shots after his first quarter blow-up performance. He's struggled a little bit in the past with some decision-making in the fourth quarter, and he even had a lob that didn't go their way in the fourth quarter tonight to Jared Allen. I think that wasn't a bad pass. I just think it was a fumble by Jared by accident. And Yeah, that wasn't on Darius. Yeah, and J.B. Bickerstaff even said post-game that they have seen Jarrett make that play 400 times out of 400 <laughs> times. So it's like you got to just take it where it comes. But I wanted to get your thoughts on Darius's performance when he was being so heavily guarded and not able to get up as many shots and not being as successful as he was in that first quarter. I mean, that's what you have to do, right? Sometimes how you perform is going to be dictated by the defense. and. I like the fact that Darius didn't try to force it all himself, even though he got off to that great start, even though he was making threes at a high clip early in the game. He did his job because he dictated turn, right? He forced the Suns to change their coverage. He forced the Suns to change some of their personnel as well. So because he got off to that great start early in the game, he did his job. And I think as the game went on, if he would have started forcing things and making mistake after mistake after mistake, it just would have compounded the problem. As a point guard, you trust your teammates. As a point guard, you're trying to make the right play. In the first quarter, based on how the defense was guarding him, it was the right thing for him to be aggressive, look for his own shots. But if they're going to send two at you constantly, then it's your job to get off the ball. It's your job to find the open man. And then it's up to the Cavs players around Darius to make the right play and and to make those shots and capitalize on the fact that they get an opportunity to play four on three and they get an opportunity to go up against a scrambly defense. So I have no problem with the fact that Darius didn't get as many shot attempts as maybe he would have liked or maybe fans would have liked after the first quarter because he was trying to do what was the best thing for the team based on how Phoenix was guarding him. And if you're Phoenix, right, you're able to do that kind of stuff on the defensive end of the floor in part because Donovan Mitchell's not there, in part because Max Struess is not there. Teams, and and this brings home another point, Teams are just not all that concerned about Isaac Okoro, despite the fact that his three-pointers are up, despite the fact that his percentage is as high as it's ever been in his career, they're still willing to say, we're going to pick our poison, and we're going to make other guys other than Darius Garland beat us. And when Max Struess is not out there taking that pressure off, and when Donovan Mitchell is not out there taking some of that burden off of Darius is a lot easier for an opponent to deploy that kind of strategy of let's get the ball out of his hands and let's force the others to make the plays or make the shots. And sometimes it's going to work for the Cavs. Sometimes they're going to make the defense pay for that kind of strategy. And other times they're not. Sam Merrill went one for five tonight from three point range. George Niang was 0 for six from three point range. Isaac Okoro was two of seven from three point range. And if you were to ask the Suns after that first quarter, how do you want to play it? They would say, all right, we'll take our chances with Niang. We'll take our chances with Okoro. We'll take our chances with a contested shot by Sam Merrill coming off of a screen. We'll take our chances even with Craig Porter Jr. It's just not going to be Darius after the first quarter. Yep, and I agree with that. And, I mean, you got to see the offense try and figure things out. And it's not like they fell apart, but... They were not as productive as they were in the first quarter. And obviously, it's hard to do that when you drop 41 in a quarter. But 
I wanted to move on, and I think we got to take a quick break here to do so. So, before I do that, I got to let y'all know about our subscription service that you guys can tune into to be the first to know about when we think Donovan Mitchell, Evan Mobley, and Max Struess will be returning. And you can do that by subscribing to Subtext. And to do that, you can sign up for a 14-day free trial or visit cleveland.com backslash Cavs and click on the blue bar at the top of the page. If you don't like it, that's fine. All you have to do is text the word STOP. It's easy, but we can tell you that the people who sign up stick around because this is the best way to get insider coverage on the Cavs from Chris and me. We'll be right back. All right, Chris, we're back, and I need to get your thoughts on something. Donovan Mitchell is now ineligible to get all NBA because he is only eligible to play 64 games after being unavailable in tonight's game against the Phoenix Suns. What is your thought on the 65-game rule for things of that nature? And we know it's going to affect other players, too. Because Joel Embiid is more than likely not going to be able to get MVP running because he's not going to be able to play for a while with his injury. And I don't know. I don't think you should get punished for injuries. And and J.B. Bickerstaff said that as well pregame. And I agree with him. What do you think, Chris? So then what's the solution then? Time management. Like you get certain amount of time for resting players without injury. I think that's the biggest thing, because I think the 65 games was supposed to limit that. But with players being injured, it's not like they just aren't playing. And I think it's unfair because you you think of players off the top of your head that come to mind that the rule was created to help them continue to play. But like if you are hurt, like if you have a bone bruise, that is a significant injury. And we saw it have Jared Allen out the first five games of the season. And Max Struess is a guy who hates not playing. And he's been out for a while with an undisclosed how serious strain to his knee. And we need to really take into consideration the fact that Donovan Mitchell loves to play the game of basketball. Darius Garland loves to play the game of basketball. Unfortunately, Darius Garland continues to get in injury situations that are really not his fault, but like just continue to happen in really illogical ways. And obviously it's hard to say that like you can prevent injuries, but to say that these guys are not going to be up for accolades that I think they deserve, or at least Donovan Mitchell has had a great season and should be on an all NBA team, whether that's second team or first team that's up for debate. But Donovan Mitchell is an all-star and MVP candidate and should be on the all-NBA teams. Yeah, nobody's debating that. Nobody's debating his merits. But the question becomes, so what do you do as a voter, as a league, if Shea Gilgis Alexander is going to play 75 games and Donovan Mitchell is going to play 55? You know what I'm saying? I get what you're saying. Yeah, I get what you're saying. I mean, at some point, the guy who is more available to his team has to be considered more valuable, right? The guy who is more available to his team and also is having a great year, just like Donovan, is going to get the edge. So is the solution put it back in the hands of the voters for them to determine their own threshold for how many games a guy can miss for them to actually put that guy on their ballot? The one thing I do like about this is that it gives voters a specific criteria to choose from, right? In the past, it was very, very difficult to differentiate between 45 incredible games of Joel Embiid and 75 games that maybe weren't as incredible, but still pretty good from another player. And it's like, who do you put on the first team or who do you vote for for MVP? So this puts everybody, every voter that has a vote, it puts them all on the same page in terms of separating between those particular players. And it just takes some of them out of the equation. That part I do like about it. But I agree with you from the standpoint of 
there should be a way for the league to differentiate between this guy is missing games because he's actually hurt and this guy is missing games because of injury management or rest or load management or however a team wants to phrase it on the injury report. And if it's a legitimate injury, that's different to me. I mean, the reason why they put this in place is because obviously they want guys to play and because load management was becoming too big of a deal. And these national TV games were being watered down because these players were missing these big games and fans that were paying good money to see them weren't getting to see them on the second game of a back-to-back. So in a way, it incentivizes them to be more available maybe even play through injury a little bit more and not allow load management to take them out of the second game of a back-to-back or the first game of a back-to-back or something along those lines. So I understand why they put it in. I just wish there was a way, and I don't know if there is a way. I wish there was a way for the league to differentiate between an injury and load management or rest or something along those lines and consider those factors when it comes to MVP or all NBA. But I don't think we can sit here and pretend that it's an easy solution because I don't think there is an easy solution. Yeah. And like J.B. Bickerstaff said pregame, it's not our job to figure that out. It's our (laughs) job to speculate. Well, it's not his job to speculate. It's our job as journalists to speculate and examine the possibilities. But Adam Silver is not listening to us. (laughs) I mean, it stinks for Donovan. It really does that he's not going to be on either all-NBA team when he's had an all-NBA season. It affects his resume. It affects his legacy in some cases. But this is the rule, right? And rules change constantly. And the NBA today is not what the NBA was in 1980. The NBA today is not what it was in the early 2000s. So I think you continue to evolve. I think you continue to adapt and see what the right way is. I don't know that this is going to be a hard and fast rule for the next 5, 10 years, 15 years or something like that. I think it's something that the NBA is going to continue to explore when it comes to the load management conversation. I think there's probably some wiggle room attached to this, especially after seeing this year, Joel Embiid being ineligible, Donovan Mitchell being ineligible, Devin Booker maybe becoming ineligible. You know, Karis LeVert's very close to not being eligible for six man of the year as well, based on the number of games that he has missed. So maybe because of what has transpired throughout the course of this season, the NBA revisits it in the offseason or the following offseason but for now it is the rule and it sucks for Donovan because he's had an MVP type season and he's had an all NBA type season but I don't like going 25 in certain areas of of Westlake or Bay Village but you know what that's the speed limit and I have to and if I'm gonna go 35 or 40 instead of 25 then they're gonna punish me or they're gonna give me a ticket if a guy doesn't play 65 games He doesn't get the end of season accolades. That's just the way it is. I like that comparison. I do. All right, Chris, really quickly, because I know we got to wrap this up. The Cavs are now going on a three-game road trip. Pelicans, then the Rockets, then the Pacers. Evan Mobley was out of his boot when we saw him after tonight's game in the locker room. Donovan Mitchell is making progress and reevaluating, doing on-court things. Max Struess still haven't heard about him, and Dean Wade was out for personal reasons. These guys are huge for this team. The Pelicans, obviously a tough squad, even though their record might not indicate so. The Rockets just lost Sangoon for a little bit due to two injuries to the same leg, so they're going to be a little bit different to deal with than they had prepared for. And the Pacers, this will be the first time that the Cavs face them with Siakam and Tyrese Halliburton. So what do you think is the biggest thing going into this road trip for the Cavs? And do you have any predictions on who might come back first for the Cavaliers? Well, Dean or Donovan's coming back first. I don't know which one yet. I haven't gotten a great grasp on that, but... I anticipate both of them coming back on this road trip. I anticipate both of them playing at some point this week based on conversations that I've had with people very, very close to them. The most important thing, I guess when Donovan comes back, the Cavs continuing to work through 
the Darius Garland Donovan Mitchell combination thing. I think that's important, especially in end of game situations if they're in closely contested games. That's important. Just coming together on the road trip and maybe finding that offensive rhythm, that offensive flow that has been lost. Can they get it back once Donovan Mitchell is back, healthy, effective, and playing more like the guy that was the all-NBA player that he was in, in the first half of the season? Because Donovan told me the other night that his knee has been bothering him basically since the first workout following the All-Star break, that he just wasn't feeling right. And yeah, he was dealing with that illness and he lost some weight and he was sick at the time, but his knee was also bothering him. And you could tell he wasn't as explosive. He wasn't driving to the basket as much. In the double overtime game against Chicago, before he finally got shut down, I think one of his shot attempts was something other than a three-pointer. So he was just kind of hovering out at the three-point line and he turned himself into a catch-and-shoot, standstill three-point shooter because he just didn't have the legs that that he did in the first half of the season. His knee just wasn't feeling right. So this has been bothering him for a long time. But if his knee responds properly, and if he can return to the form that he showed early in the season, can the Cavs find their offensive flow? Can they find their offensive rhythm with Darius and Donovan together? That's one thing that I'm going to be looking at on this road trip. Problem is... I don't think Evan Mobley is going to be back on this road trip. And everything that I understand about Max Struess, it's looking like end of the month-ish for his return, unless he fights his butt off to get back in the lineup because he hates missing games that much. And he just says, you know, maybe I'm not 100%. Maybe it's a little bit early, but I am tired of missing these games. I want to be back out there with my guys. If If he takes the time that is probably required for this particular injury, then I don't think Max comes back until the end of the month. So those are two big pieces in Struess and Mobley that the Cavs will be missing that keeps them potentially from building continuity, building rhythm, working through some sets that they would want to use in the playoffs. I mean, it is getting late quick here, Ethan, in terms of the Cavs having enough time to get all their guys back and come together the way that they want to going into the postseason. Yeah, Chris, and I think the biggest thing for me, because of how much shuffling the Cavs have done and not really having much of a break to really get to know each other again with this new team and all these lineups shifting around, is we talked about those two days in between games for the between the Pelicans and the Rockets game for Donovan's progression and potentially him coming back for that Rockets game. Also, Tristan Thompson will be back for that game. Just remember that. I think them just being able to get time to practice and hang out with each other are two things that this lineup that has been switching around and potentially could switch around even more when they come back on the 16th. That's the biggest thing that I'm looking for because You don't know how much these guys hang out off the court. And obviously they have a good relationship when they're in the locker room and things of that nature because they just got done playing 48 minutes together. But it's really an interesting dynamic to see how NBA players interact off the court. And we know that they've had different stints where they've been caught up talking about different players around the league and AAU players and things of that nature and creating continuity. We keep coming back to this continuity, the joy factor that these guys create with one another and the opportunity to continue to build these relationships because a lot of these guys are young. That's the other thing. We want to see this team grow and I don't feel like this team is just this year because with Donovan Mitchell still being on the contract and being able to come back for another year and those conversations that we've had on multiple occasions on this podcast, I think this team continues to grow. They didn't make moves at the trade deadline to do that and to keep the chemistry that they had, but they're still building said chemistry. And I think that's really important, especially, like I said, multiple times with how things have been changing and the roller coaster ride that has been this season. I also think it's important for them to get some work in as a team in a non-game situation, to work through some things, to allow J.B. Bickerstaff 
to stop and teach and show and them to see some things from a different lens when the game is not coming as fast as what it has been during this grind of a schedule. So there have been times recently, Ethan, where they have canceled shoot arounds, where they haven't had shoot arounds before games because they want to save their legs, because the schedule has been too grueling, because they don't have enough guys. <laughs> I mean, there have been times where they just haven't done practice. They've just turned it into a film day or a treatment day because they don't have enough guys to go five on five or anything like that. And I know it's late in the season, it's March, and teams really aren't doing a lot of five on five at this stage of the season. But maybe that's something that they do need a little bit of work on together. And with a couple of days off in between New Orleans and Houston, it just allows them to get on the court in a different kind of environment, in a different kind of setting, to potentially work through some of these problems that that we have seen pop up since the All-Star break, and maybe even implement new plays and new sets that they have been wanting to do that they haven't had the opportunity. All right, Chris. We said this was going to be a short episode, but there was, was so much to get into. 40 minutes is not short, Chris. We, we we both know that's not short. It was 40 minutes, really? It didn't feel like 40 minutes. That's what makes a great podcast. When we just start spitting the information and giving it to our subtexters, our subscribers, our listeners, and you only get this information with the Wine and Gold Talk podcast. And with all that being said... That'll wrap up today's episode. So to get more insider information, go ahead and sign up for a 14-day free trial or visit cleveland.com backslash Cavs and click on the blue bar at the top of the page. If you don't like it, that's fine. All you have to do is text the word stop. It's easy, but we can tell you that the people who sign up stick around because this is the best way to get insider coverage on the Cavs from me and Chris. This isn't just our podcast. It's your podcast. And the only way to have your voice heard is through subtext. Y'all be safe. We out.